Okay, there we go. So, Senator Boyer, good evening, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. Also, uh, Trisha and I would like to thank warmly Veronica Carozzi, who is Senator Boyer, Parliamentary Affairs Advisor. She helped us organize this great lecture, this guest lecture, sorry. So, thanks to you both. And uh, we'd like to acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated in Treaty 4 territory with a presence in Treaty 6 territory. Treaty 4 is the traditional territory of the Cree, Salto, Nakota, Lakota, and Dakota peoples, and is the homeland of the Métis people. And today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples. So, <clears throat> Senator Boyer, please accept our apologies for having to endure another Zoom meeting. But for us, students of public policy, it's a true <laughs> honor to be able to discuss fundamental policy issues with you and to learn from your unique perspective. So, the Honorable Yvonne Boyer is a member of the Métis Nation of Ontario with her ancestral roots in the Métis Nation, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and the Red River. So, she will give a brief introduction of herself and her work and then open the discussion up to the students' questions. So, please join Trish and I in virtually welcoming Senator Boyer to this class. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. And, um, Bruno and I have known each other for a number of years, and we always seem to meet on, on committee meetings. And we have the same students uh, over the years. And uh, so I'm really honored that Bruno was able to ask me to come speak to you tonight. And I really appreciate it. I also teach at uh, JSGS as well. I teach Health Law and Policy 841, just, as, just so you know. <laughs> um, so I'm here to talk to you tonight about the issue of forced and coerced sterilization and where we're at. And um, I'm going to go back a little bit to some of my background. And I was a nurse before I was a lawyer. And so the work that I naturally do is health related. And it looks at the intersection between health and the law. And that's informs everything that I do in the Senate and in all of the professional work I've undertaken over the last 25 years. And, and my interest in the topic of forced and coerced sterilization has been with me probably since I was a little girl. And my aunt who I lived with was very influential in my life. And I believe she was sterilized, although she did not tell me that. I, she never had any children and she always wanted children. And she spent 10 years in a tuberculosis sanatorium at Fort Quipel. And uh, five of that was in a body cast. And she talked to me about racism in the healthcare system. Although she didn't really say that, she talked about the monsters that walk the halls. And, um, and so that really influenced my early thought, and it was my bedtime stories that influenced the work. And I can't even say it's work that I do. It's a calling, it's a drive of, and, and, and my interest in, in sterilization. So it, with all of the, the work I've done in law school and in, in my graduate work as well, I had sterilization as one of my topics. In, in many of the papers I've written, there's always a section on forced sterilization and what I found with the eugenics legislation and, and how it you know, sort of moved through history. And because I've had an interest in it and I've been vocal throughout my time as a lawyer in uh, 2000 and I think it was 16, I received a phone call from Betty Ann Adam of the Star Phoenix. And Betty Ann said to me, hey, Vaughn, there's two women that are here that have come to see me that say that they were sterilized in a Saskatoon hospital and against their will and they're indigenous. And what do you have to say about that? Well, I said, you know, that's a crime. You can't go, you know, sterilizing people against their will with no consent and especially, um, you know, if in, in this day and age, it, it was just, I, you know, I thought, wow, that just can't be so. So she did her article and the two women that had come forward at that time was Tracy Benab 
and Brenda Palshay, and I say their names with great honor because they were the ones who started all of all all breaking it open Betty Ann and those two women so the the women were very brave they were the true warriors of the whole movement that I say we have right now with forced and coerced sterilization in Canada and then after those two came forward after Tracy and Brenda came forward another one came forward and another one and another one and another one and until we had probably 11 at right in the very beginning, 11 women that say that they were sterilized at the Saskatoon hospital and, and it was without consent. So in the meantime, I'm giving interviews through various outlets talking about, you know, what's happening and saying that saying the same thing over and over again it's a breach of aboriginal and treaty rights it's a crime it's assault it's battery it's the um against all of the undrip principles it's everything and so i would give interviews and i did four or five interviews across the country and then i got a call from saskatoon health authority and they said we'd like you to do an external review of our tubal ligation policies and i said I think you've got the wrong person. I've been bad mouthing you all across the country. And they said, um, no, the elders have asked for you. So we'd like you to do it. And I had, you know, I said, well, if you want me to do it and the elders have asked, I will do it, but we'll need somebody else to, to help us. So I knew Dr. Judy Bartlett, she was a Métis physician and she had worked in the hospitals. Uh, she knew, um, she knows the culture of the hospital. I worked in the operating room. I know the culture of the operating room. I know the culture of the hospitals. I had been a healthcare professional for a number of years and she was also a healthcare professional and it was very much, um, very, it was, it was a good, it was a good match between Dr. Bartlett and I because we, we worked very well together and what we did was we it was community a community-based justice and i and i you i think bruno you had assigned that on in the syllabus for for reading material is the report okay so you're familiar with how the report is laid out and the community com community engagement for the research that we did and how the voices of the women actually came forward in that report so that was sort of the beginning and i thought okay so now we've we've got that, but that report was the the catalyst for the class action lawsuit that's currently happening in Saskatchewan with over a hundred women in Saskatchewan. With the last one was was recorded in December two thousand and eighteen to a thirty year old woman, and um, so that's the lawsuit that's happening there. My office, in the meantime, has become somewhat of a clearinghouse for forced and coerced sterilization. And people have called me from all over the country that have been sterilized. And uh, right now, we, we know that there has been mass sterilizations in Nova Scotia. We know uh, we, we're quite likely Quebec, where we were just delving into it when COVID hit. Um, Ontario, Manitoba, British Columbia, and Alberta. And we know that there's sterilizations going on where there are high numbers of Indigenous women. And, um, and we know that it's, and Ver if uh, Veronica's on here, maybe she can talk a little bit of, we have a mapping project that Veronica's in charge of. So basically what we're doing right now is we have a a map that we're working on from across the country. And we have plotted out where the pods of women that are that have been sterilized. And we're doing something like an overlay on it. We're doing a comparative analysis with where are the residential schools, where are the mining camps, where are the trafficking corridors, and and where the other um, other determinants, uh, what are the other determinants, possible determinants of sterilization? So that's something that our office is working on. Uh, we've also, uh, at this, at this we've, we've had a, in the 42nd parliament, we had a 
a short study on forced and coerced sterilization where we brought in witnesses from Health Canada. We brought in witnesses from uh, the class action lawsuits, which are also happening not just in Saskatchewan, they're in Alberta, British Columbia, and all throughout Canada as well. So, um, so the, uh, the offices definitely, we get lots of interviews. I mean, I get lots of requests for interviews on this topic and the topic of racism in the healthcare system, which I did another one today with um, the Globe and Mail on a young girl, seven years old, who was subjected to a pelvic exam uh, and she was an indigenous seven-year-old indigenous girl that was subjected to a pelvic exam by a doctor who who did not have consent to do that and she forced her legs apart to do it so that's I mean I these are the kind of calls that I get and things that are happening across the country to indigenous people and um, and that's and then we have the Joyce Etchequan case we have so much going on right now with uh, with the topic of of structural racism and discrimination within our healthcare system. And Veronica, do you wanna say anything about the mapping project? Um, I think I think you handled it. Um, basically, like Senator Boyer said, it is, um, uh, we were looking at doing it globally and it was just too huge. So we focused on Canada and it's broken down um, by province. And it's basically just to show sterilization exists. Um, there are a lot of people that feel that this was happening or it, it's something in the past or they know what happened way back when and um, nobody realizes that it is something that has happened today and is, is still happening. Um, so that's what the what we're hoping to show and it's um, obviously there's a correlation where there were Indian hospitals where there are residential schools high indigenous populations clearly have a much higher um, amount of women being sterilized. It's not, it's not white women that this is happening to. This is happening specifically to indigenous women and um, they are often coerced into um, either agreeing to the procedure by being threatened of having their child taken away that they're currently giving birth to. They're under duress when they're asked for their consent or there are other cases where women have gone in because they have had an issue with their appendix and they haven't even realized it and they've come out sterilized. So it's um, it's uh, just basically we're doing a map to show to show where it's happening and and how prevalent it is in Canada. Senator, I was going to attach Senator Boyer was actually mm -hmm. a part of a conversation with the ministers two weeks ago about racism in our healthcare system. I can attach your remarks to the comments, Senator, if anybody would like those, because those are, are very powerful remarks. Sure, that'd be fine. Yeah, you can put them in our little chat box there, Veronica. That'd yeah. be great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so um, does anybody have any questions up to this point? Anybody want to comment or anything? How to fix it? <laughs> Yeah, there are, I think, I, I mean, the first question that the students prepared is about precisely this, this issue. So I'm going to call the group mm -hmm. Idzi. And sorry, the, the, the student groups uh, have uh, Korean pop band names. Uh, that's my fault. Um, so, Idzi. <laughs> Hi, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Jill. Yep. Hi. Hi, Jill. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, I just had a question related to the report that we've all read. I'm just wanting to know uh, more about since it was published, if there was any current update on the success of those calls to action. If not, will there be some sort of follow up? But it sounds like you're doing a lot of work currently. So we just I just kind of wondered about that. Mm -hmm. That yeah, that's um, I'm glad you asked that because in January of this year, we had a conference. Uh, it was put on by the National Collaborating Center of Indigenous Health from BC. And we brought together uh, the, the people who um, were, ha have been dealing with the issue of forced and coerced sterilization in the country. We had Quebec representing representation and we had uh, many of the provinces. We had the federal government there. We had, um, the uh, lawyers there, and we also had the Saskatoon Health Authority. 
and that was it was it was wonderful to have them there and i have to say you know f throughout all of this i have to really pat them on the back and and thank them for ever hiring me and dr bartlett to do this because they didn't have to and uh and they were very very good to work with they wanted to get to the bottom of it they their heart, they didn't want to see any of this happening. They wanted to, genuinely to stop it. And they were doing whatever they could. So I, I always try to make sure that I thank them publicly for that. And, um, and so I have been working with the Saskatoon Health Authority now and again since then. And um, sorry, I've got do a dog snoring right beside me here. And, um, and so, uh, and they came to the meeting and we talked about what we could do, how we could work together to help implement those recommendations. But you see the recommendations were, were put in place at a time when there was only maybe, you know, possibly 20 women that had come forward. So now we know that the, the issues are much more widespread and the recommendations, uh, they had told me that they, had been working on them diligently and that they had some success. So that was what what their update was in January. So uh, I'm I'm available to talk to them or help them or or do whatever I can with them at any time. Does that help, Jill? Does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, we, we have uh, another question from the group Big Bang. Okay, um, so my question, uh, the paper identifies a wide gap between uh, a standard healthcare provider's worldview versus an indigenous woman's worldview. And uh, do you th I'm just wondering, could education serve as a feasible means to alleviate this gap or would a more radical structural reconfiguration of the healthcare system be required? Well, um, education won't, it won't, it's something. And I think the education has to start right at the, at a very young age and in school, like with every kid in school who doesn't know anything about indigenous history or indigenous people at all. And so education is, is a critical part of it, but it isn't the whole thing. It's I've gotten to a point where I've, I've al almost become completely radical. Like we got to restructure the, all the legislation. We got to go full out. And when you read what the recommendations I have, like last Friday, as, as to the recommendations you see in that report, you'll see the difference in the tone and the structure and the radicalization of what needs to be done. So, um, and that's over, like, that's three years of being immersed in this topic. And that's where we're at right now is what Veronica is going to post is, is the remarks for, for that ur urgent emergency meeting on systemic racism in the healthcare system. So I have to say that education is important. It's very important and it must start at a very, very young age. And it has to be in, in medical school and the, the, the licensing I mean, there, there's so much that has come forward since that report was written that it's, it's just overwhelming the things that we've been able to look at, such as licensing requirements for physicians and what kind of medical education are they getting as far as Indigenous people go. So, and every province is different. So there, there's, uh, I'm really fortunate that I'm so close to Ottawa U and we have interns, we have at least four or five or six or eight interns up per year in common law that come over to work with me at the Senate. So I have almost like a, like a little army that's able to do research on certain topics and that we, I have interns that come for three months. No, that's not true. Um, it's 115 hours and they get three credits for their common law degree. And so we have very, you know, 
motivated, brilliant young minds working on each one of these topics. So one of the, the topics that I would give one of the interns is get me all the, the medical licensing, get me the, the requirements, put it in a chart for me. Let's do a comparison on what the requirements are and where are the gaps? What could be done better in all of these requirements? And then I go meet with the people that are doing the licensing. And we talk about that. So then I'm, I've, I've got something in my hand that's tangible that can say, okay, maybe this will help or this will help. But I've also gotten to a point where uh, I'm seeing that, that uh, legislation, maybe even just provincial legislation, I thought that possibly federal legislation that deals with consent might be an option. But after the work I've done with the lawyers at the Senate and the uh, legislative drafters and the people that know about how to craft legislation that's going to work, I think that it's probably better to look at at uh, provincial legislation that is able to um, standardize policies in health care facilities in hospitals that could provide some sort of standardized policies that all the hospitals would have to follow. Uh, because right now, the policies in every hospital are different. And that seems to be a problem. So that's Thank sort you. of a long answer. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question from the group EXO. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, along with uh, the report, we were given an article from the CBC that was written uh, by Andrea Landry. And, and um, she talks about how usually when you know reports like this come out, uh, it usually comes with a public apology and then their recommendations or lists of things that should happen. Um, but more often than not, they're kind of shelved off to the side. Um, so following this issue being brought to light and the thorough investigation, uh, have things changed in Saskatoon or what tangible changes have been put into place since the investigation? Um, this kind of piggybacks a bit on Jill's question, I guess, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that uh, before I agreed to do the work for them, I said that part of the, con it has to be written into the contract that whatever I write will become public. And, uh, and that was an agreement because I wouldn't have done it had, had it not been able to become public. And so they, they agreed to that. And um, as far as exactly what they've done, I know that when this first started happening, they had a knee jerk reaction and they were so appalled that um, what they did was something that kind of made it worse because they said that any, any, anybody who's coming for a tubal ligation has to have a, like um, uh, an okay from your family doctor that this is what you're, you're going to be doing. And so th they wrote that into policy and implemented it. But essentially what that did was it removed the agency of indigenous women to be able to have a tubal ligation if they wanted it. Because often, I mean, in the Saskatoon area, the catchment is from the North. So you've got women that are the only prenatal care they have is in a walk-in clinic. They don't have a family doctor. And so if they wanted a tubal ligation, they wouldn't be able to have it. So again, it's a top-down approach that isn't working. And you'll see what the recommendations from the urgent meeting is that the people who are affected have to be the ones that are advising and part of the solution. And that was a typical uh, example of a top-down approach that just did not work. It, it did not work for the women at all. So, um, but uh, in, on a positive note, the last communication I had was that they had been implementing the recommendations and they thought that they were doing a better job. However, um, I, I don't know what the stats are on the women who have joined the class action lawsuit and where they were sterilized. So I can't answer everything uh, because I just don't know and I'm not sure I want to know um, just because there's so many other really positive things to try to um, try to work on that 
is bringing light to this. We, we've worked with all kinds of people. The interviews that I've given have been all over the world. We've had the Washington Post, we had Germany, Sweden, Spain, we had all different countries that are, have an eye on Canada. And just a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, with another UN committee who has taken a great interest in what we're doing. And we have Amnesty International and we've worked with uh, the women from Peru that were over 200,000 women were sterilized. So it's, um, you know, it's a worldwide problem. And we are, um, you know, we're working, we're working to bring it to light. And like Veronica said, it's, uh, it's, it's happening today. It's not yesterday, it's today. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, there is now a question from the group Mamamouh. Um, did you choose? Did you choose which one? Um, I'll just choose one. Um, so, our, our first one was um, uh, what do you uh, what you think about the recent death of Joyce uh, Ekakwan? Um, she died mm -hmm. earlier this month. Um, she filmed. Uh, nurses making discriminatory uh, remarks towards her um, and then uh, she was denied service and, and later died uh, in the hospital. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. um, so as a former nurse, uh, I'm just curious to know, uh, you know, how you've, you've obviously experienced that behavior. Um, and uh, do you know a, a path forward to stop discrimination in the medical field? Well, I have a list of recommendations in the article that I don't know if Veronica's posted it yet. Um, but uh, as far as, as the Joyce Etchequan story goes, um, I've been interviewed several times about this. And basically, people ask me about what give me an example of Indigenous people being discriminated against in the hospital. And I generally say, hmm, let's turn that around to when have I ever known Indigenous people to have a good experience in the hospital? And, I, and as a matter of fact, no one has told me that they've had a good experience in the hospital. So that's the standard we're, we're looking at here is, um, for every Joyce Echequan that videotaped that, there's a hundred more that didn't. And so uh, she was an anomaly that was able, she was able to be in tune enough with what was going on around her to try to put a stop to this. And she was successful because now what we have is we have the ministers, we have Minister Miller, we have Minister Bennett, um, saying there, this is horrifying, and it is horrifying, and but this is this is normal for indigenous people. This is not an anomaly, and her death has got to mean something. They're talking about Joyce's principle now, and implementing that. And what's happened from the the urgent meeting on race on um, racism in the healthcare system is that there's a follow-up. With that meeting, there was several indigenous doctors that talked about the racism that they have experienced in the healthcare system and uh, actually as patients and as doctors and, and what their lifetime has been like working within a racist healthcare system. And so the, the, that meeting was just a preliminary meeting and I'm hoping that the follow-up meeting in January will see some more results and uh, some action that is being taken to address the structural racism in the healthcare system. So yes, I'm familiar with the Joyce Echequan case, sadly so. Mm -hmm. So uh, Matthew has another question, I believe. So, okay. 
Um, I was actually, so for my undergraduate thesis, I did um, uh, the political philosophy underlying the Nazi eugenics program. Um, mm. I, have, I have cerebral palsy myself. So I was just wondering um, if you're familiar with uh, that period of history, uh, whether you see similarities between uh, those programs and uh, the past uh, Canadian eugenics programs and practices that are, that are still happening today. So um, that was a topic that one of our interns researched for us. So our office has, has, has uh, various uh, research papers and that was a topic of one of them. But I would love to have your, a copy of your thesis if you would send it to us, I'd love it. Um, that is something that is, um, I think it's really important to um, make sure, like on my website, um, and Veronica can probably confirm this, is this would be a great place to, to post these kind of papers and uh, anything that's on the topic, because the more we, we get these, these ideas out, the more people are going to understand that this is uh, history repeating itself, or, or it's, no, it's still going on. It started back, I don't know, since the beginning of time, I suppose. And, uh, and historically, it's been used throughout history. And, and not just in Canada, in many, many countries. And uh, thank you for bringing that up, because that's really important that, that people are aware of that that it's not isolated to one or two instances, that it has been mass, uh, um, like I mentioned Peru as well. Peru had, uh, the, the government was forcibly sterilizing indigenous women and there was over 200,000 of them that were sterilized. And now they're just getting reparation. They have um, a registry system that we, we've looked at to see if that's viable for Canada and to see if there's some sort of holistic approach. Because what happens, um, I'm gonna give you a typical, for instance, what happens is um, I checked into a hotel um, before, the, before COVID and it was about nine o'clock at night and the, um, the, the young clerk at the, at the front desk said to me, she said, oh, you're that famous Senator. And I said, well, I'm not very famous and I am a Senator. And she says, no, you're the Senator of sterilization. And I said, well, that's a topic that I, I work on in my office. And there wasn't anybody in the lobby, but her and I, and she said, they did it to me. They did it to me when I was 20 and I had four children then and they sterilized me against my will. And, and I mean, I get quite emotional when I'm, when I'm talking about it. Um, and she said, I'm 35 now and my kids are all grown and I want more children and I can't have any more. And now, and so what I'm thinking is, you know, where's the reparation for her? Where is IVF? You know, she could with $10,000, she could possibly be a mother again, or there's, there could be, there could be ways for her to, to, repair, not repair, but to address some of the issues that she's had to undergo. So that was, it was, it was hard. Um, I'm not sure what happened to her. She, uh, I gave her all my contact information and I, I probably sent her to one of the lawyers that's doing a class action lawsuit in hopes that she could get some reparation. Thank you very much. Um, and I think just to follow up, uh, I think that when we talk about the parallels between Canadian policies and German policies uh, following uh, the Nuremberg trials, especially the, uh, the medical ones in 46, 47, uh, the judges uh, created the so-called Nuremberg Code. And so I think that's uh, <coughs> extremely important and still uh, useful today. Um, It'd so, be interesting to do a comparative analysis. Mm -hmm, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because you had also um, sterilizations in California, I heard, mm -hmm. in other states as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. A comparative analysis would be, uh, I think, very, very interesting. Yeah, and the diffusion of uh, eugenic IDs 
uh, mm-hmm. in, the, in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. Well, also just on that topic, Bruno, um, I do know that um, in Canada, we had the sterilization legislation in BC and Alberta, and it was nearly enacted in Saskatchewan. And so, um, because I've thought really hard about what, um, you know, why, why is this happening? And then I realized that the eugenics legislation that we had in Canada has probably created underpinnings of in our health policies we have today that say it's okay it's okay to sterilize women it's okay to sterilize mentally um so-called mentally unfit people and uh because that's what the legislation provided for at the time so we have with with legislation i mean if you look at the hansard during that time and the hansard is is really critical for any of you doing research on this topic uh go to the hansard in the province that you're looking at or or the federal government in the time and see what the legislators were actually talking about on the chamber floor on the legislative floor and you'll get a real insight to society at that time and um you know that might be you know another good research topic so uh anyway i just wanted to mention that i think that the legislation that we have in Canada underpins the health policies that we have today. Thank you very much. Um, now we have other questions. Is it possible to have a second round? We'll finish in 10 minutes. Is it okay? Veronica. Veronica, is it fine? If we finish. I was talking and I didn't unmute myself. My apologies. Um, can we do a few quick questions and then I've got to get her out. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Perfect. So, uh, Big Bang, you had another question. Oh, okay. Uh, have you encountered any resistance from uh, provincial governments when presenting the need for a national review? If so, what is the nature of this resistance? Um, no, I actually haven't. Um, I haven't uh, g- gotten any resistance, probably because I haven't actually gone and met with them. The, the work that I do is federal, because as a senator, we're a federal body, and um, we're looking at a federal response. So the witnesses that we had in our Senate committee, and in, in our Human Rights Senate committee, were uh, federal related, but... Um, I would, and I wouldn't mind working with the provinces, but you see, um, before COVID, that that was just getting organized, and then COVID came and everything got stopped. So perhaps with the new renewed interest in systemic racism in the healthcare system, we will see that. And we'll see a, a roundtable with provincial partners. And uh, I'm hoping to see that. So I, I haven't met any resistance yet. Um, and if they come to the table, well, actually, Quebec has been a bit resistant. but um, the, And they've been resistant publicly. But I, you know, like, it, if we're at a table, perhaps things would be different. So uh, I really can't answer that yet, but I'm I'm hopeful that it would be a useful meeting. I like your little dog in the background. Thank you for uh, <laughs> the answer and that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped a question from the group Girls, Girls Generation. All right, uh, no worries. Uh, just a second here. Uh, So, Senator, uh, you had mentioned uh, earlier today uh, that being steeped uh, in this topic for a few years now has led to some uh, radicalization on your part, uh, you know, regarding large scale structural change. So do you have any thoughts on how the Canadian government can, you know, overcome or reconcile its role as a colonial system and ensure the the safety of Indigenous women uh, for the future? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one, because I mean, I'm working in a system now that's 150 years old, like the Senate, and uh, this is so ingrained. Uh, The colonial system is very much ingrained. But I see a little bit at a time, you know, I see sparks of light, 
we have, uh, well, we have 11 Indigenous senators. We had 12, and uh, Senator Dick just retired. And so I'm hoping that we'll get some more Indigenous senators. So what I do with, as an Indigenous senator, I look at all of the legislation from that Indigenous viewpoint. And I'm the one who's sitting there in committee or wherever I am saying, hey, what about Section 35 under the Constitution, Aboriginal and Treaty Rights? We're breaching them. So we've got to do something about it. And then the other senators, we've got uh, Senator Mary Jane McCallum, who has just been uh, just like a little Wolverine at, at, uh, at the environment committees. And she is saying, you know, the women from the Indigenous women have to be heard. And she's you know, she's amending legislation. She says, I've got 12 amendments that the women told me to do. And so she's there, she's like a bulldog. And so that's what we're doing is we're, um, you know, the, the voices are, the women that, that are speaking to me that have been sterilized are in my head. And, and I'm looking at the, all the work that I do with their voice and saying, no, you can't do a top-down approach. You've got to ask these people. Let's get a committee together. Let's talk to them. We're trying to do phase two right now. I've got a motion on the floor of the chamber to do phase two and bring in women that have been sterilized who want to be brought in and talk and let's hear their voices. Let's hear from them what's going to help. And, um, and I think that that's, that's really critical. So uh, yes, it's a big, huge colonial system and it moves at glacial speeds. And, um, but you know, there, there is hope. There's um, gender parity now, at least. There's, there's as many women as there is men in the Senate. And, um, and there are indigenous voices that are very strong. There's very strong voices in there. Okay, thank you. Veronica, is it possible to take one last question? I want to have your permission before. I... Sure, yeah, this is this will be the final final one if anyone has a comment that they'd like, they'd like to make. Okay, thank you. So uh, EXO, you had uh, another question. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, in your experience as an Indigenous woman holding several high-level positions in healthcare and law and government, can you speak a little bit to the concept of representation and the importance of having the voices and perspectives of Indigenous women heard at all levels of decision-making? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a um, a bill that's that's on the floor right now about about culturally relevant gender based analysis, and that's something that I'm trying to get all of government to talk about. Not just gender based analysis, but culturally relevant gender based analysis, which means that the whole colonial background of indigenous women has to be taken into account when looking at everything. So with indigenous women, the gender and the culture cannot be separated. It's all one and the same. So um, Trish Montour writes about that very, in a very beautiful way. And it's a book called Thunder in My Soul. And, and the work that has come out of Native Women's Association of Canada and the Ontario Native Women's Association and others and other indigenous women's groups have really advocated for a culturally relevant gender-based analysis. So in, within the Senate structure, this is what I'm trying to do. And every chance I get to insert it into a speech, I do. And so um, right now we're, we're writing speeches. We've got legislation that's coming very quickly and we're busy, busy, busy writing speeches because we're going hybrid. So my speeches are gonna be from right here and every chance I get, no matter what I'm speaking to, I'm going to try to talk about how important that, it's, that the legislation is looked at through an indigenous women's viewpoint, indigenous women's viewpoint that has 
been been taken into account everything that has that that is part of her as an Indigenous woman. So um, did that answer your question, Krista? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, great. Perfect, thank you so much, Senator Boyer. Thank you, Veronica, for uh, you know, helping us uh, getting on the right track. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to send you, Veronica, the MP4 by Friday. And so everybody, if you can uh, join uh, Trish and I and thank Senator Boy and Veronica and uh, have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I just, I just want wanted to mention, question. there's um, a question here with the cases of force and core sterilization. Are there also separate investigations going on through the provincial colleges of medicine? Um, that I don't know. Again, um, that was kind of stopped when the round table was canceled with, with the provinces. So I'm hoping that we'll have answers to that uh, in the very near future, Alana. So I'm um, sorry, there's, there's no answers, but you know, I recognize your question and it's a very important one because that needs to happen too. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Great, thank I, you um, again. You, feel Sandra. free to contact my office. We answer all emails and, um, and Veronica, and we're on the Senate website, so we're easy to find too. And I have my own website that you're free to contact us on. So please do. That's what I was just going to say. If anyone okay. wants to reach out, um, you just have to Google Senator Boyer and you'll find my email there. Um, I have emailed Bruno Senator Boyer's remarks. They were too large to include in the chat, but okay. I think a lot of you will, will find those very useful because it's uh, current. It's all about Joyce Eshaquan and it's all about the Indigenous people in the healthcare system. And, and like I said, it's very, very current. Um, if anyone has any questions, supplementals, anything like that, by all means, feel free to reach out to us. And if you're looking for anything more on sterilization, Senator Boyer's personal website, not the Senate of Canada one, but the personal one, she has a whole priorities list of sterilization items. And we've got a newsletter on there that um, is mm -hmm. really great. I'll just, uh, there, I sent the link to that. There's a link to our newsletter on sterilization. And that kind of gives you just a broad brush of of where it's gone and where it, where we are at now okay great great thank, thank you, so, you much. so much okay thank you very much bye for now bye, bye everyone you. have a great bye. night bye thank you too good night